So you want the G G two or something like that, or earlier? Uh, let's make it earlier. Okay, so E? C. Oh, C you wanted already. Okay. What do you call it, Mark Garrett? Governance? Governance. Okay, can I? Okay, Lauren? Sorry, Claus, thank you. Uh, I was just wondering about soil erosion and uh, lack of moisture. Is there is there something we need to be discussing about that or? Will that be in your report? or We're going to cover it both in my report and on our level of service. We're going to key on in on soil erosion. Thank you. Okay, if there's nothing else, then can I have a mover to move the agenda as uh, amended? Morris? Okay, everybody in favor? Okay, that's carried. Then we'll move on to uh, confirmation of the minutes from. Uh, 9th of September 2021. Are there any errors or omissions there? No, we're doing the minutes first. First, we'll, we'll do the approve the minutes from from last time. Okay. Did you want a number? Okay, then we'll then we'll change that. Okay, then we'll uh, Jeremy, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, last fall when we did it, we did appoint two people as voting members. We always have done it that way. Correct. But yeah. the terms of reference actually states that the chair and the co-chair are supposed to be the voting delegates. So we should have covered that off in the uh, organizational meeting. Like I said, it's just a small, small detail as far as the government's portion. I uh, was never aware of that. 23 years I sat on council, I never knew that. Gary? And that's just because the uh, terms of reference document never existed until last year. That's the reason for that. And it was missed at the organizational meeting on how we got it. Okay, thanks for that uh, clarification there. Okay. And as far as the terms of reference, yes, that was something that we never had a term of reference for this committee, which was something that uh, we did put in place. So for all of our, uh, all the committees of council essentially have so with that said, uh, so we would only have the chair and the co-chair would be the voting members, but that would also be the only member that, so then we would have uh, one less person on the Agriculture Service Committee. You can still nominate an alternate. Okay. Okay. So as part of this process here, we should nominate somebody who is going to be the co-chair as well. Uh, we have that for this committee, so whether it's uh, one of the two voting delegates that are Uh, thank you mr. chair where are we right now in terms of our voting delegates who are they just as a refresher I am one of them and Morris and uh, Lauren were voting members and uh, I was chair of uh, agriculture service board and you were set up as the alternate uh, that was not made clear at the time of uh, last fall yeah, you're the alternate. yeah okay Yep, 
that uh, fine with me, fine with you guys? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of lost at why we're doing this, actually. Like, what difference does it make who has voting power? If you have two people assigned to be it, what difference does it make, whether they're the chair and the co-chair or whether they're... Well, I think that uh, the difference is probably, Lauren, that it's uh, following the terms of reference and, and uh, doing it that way. I think that is, why, that is why this is brought up. So when did we approve the terms of reference? Can you put your mic on? You can't hear me without it. Um, but I think just for clarity's sake, too, before the organizational meeting as administration, we should float all the committees ahead of time with the terms of reference so that council's well aware of what the expectations are. And then that way, when we go into the organizational meetings, we will have our ducks in a row. Okay, so for now, I would recommend that we leave things the way they are and look at it at the organizational meeting again. Okay. And we do have an ASB meeting in the fall, so I can bring a new term of reference in. Mm -hmm. not okay, thank you. Just to, for us new folks, so the terms of reference were just created last year, correct? Correct. And then, so was that done at at the board or the council or who put those together? Like I understand the concept of having all the committees of council have terms of reference, which is absolutely important to me. Um, but it was just, just to get clear, because I hear what Lauren's saying is that if he wasn't aware that we had approved it or what was the, what was the process or how, how, how did that come to be? Or? So in our review essentially of committees last year, we had the audit committee and we had a few other ones. It was the ASB was one that did not have a terms of reference. So then that was developed, it was passed at the, I believe it was <coughs> April 2021, ASB, September. September, okay, so it was approved this fall. By the council. By the council, yeah. the council or, the or by the council or the committee. Or the committee. Yeah. Okay, Gary? It was covered at the fall ASB meeting and then it had to be forwarded to a council meeting to be passed by council. Okay. That's how the process is to work in ASB. Okay. Perfect, that's all I just wanted to understand. Okay, so if everybody's uh, okay with that, we'll just leave things the way they are for now, and we will uh, we will uh, sort that out uh, at the organizational meeting in the fall. Probably not because we're not changing anything. Okay, that's it. Okay, then we'll move on to uh, the minutes from uh, September 9th, 2021. Are there any errors or omissions? If not, can I have a mover? Okay, um, so moved. Okay, everybody in favor? That's carried. <coughs> then we will go to uh, Supervisor Agriculture Service uh, report, and uh, probably Gary, will you take it from there? I will, thank you. Uh, for those of you that are new to the Ag Service Board, I'll cover off my report and feel free to stop me with questions as we go through it and uh, I'll answer them the best I can. And if I can't answer them, I'll, I'll, I'll get them at a later date for you. So we'll get right into it. Um, our ASB grant, uh, the provincial grant, is in its current five-year uh, term. That'll run from 2020 to 2024. Uh, we currently receive $123,000 from the legislative funding and $91,000 for resource management. Moving on to mowing, uh, approximately 5,100 miles of gravel and hardtop road slopes were mowed in 2021. Uh, most were mowed deeper into the ditch where we could on, on some of the paved roads. Uh, not a lot of grass to mow on the second cut. The second cut, we were getting uh, rid of the weeds. The weeds in Kosha in particular did very well last year. So uh, you still see the mowers out there and we just could not leave Kosha our weeds. So we covered most of the roads. We use a combination of triple gang mowers and a disc mower. Uh, the disc, disc mower runs very economically. If there's not a lot to cut, we'll, we'll zip over things with that. Uh, hamlets and subdivisions, they were mowed and weed whipped twice. And uh, when the roadside mowers go by, if needed, we'll touch them up. Uh, we keep things fairly clean there. I think they, they look pretty good. And last year was uh, an easier year on those as well because 
there's just no moisture. Uh, mowing was also done for weed control and hard to spray areas of shoulder poles or, or construction from the past. Uh, and that's before uh, the grass is able to have a chemical application. You can't spray grass right, right away when you, when you seed it. So uh, weed control, uh, the majority of roadside spraying took place in divisions four, five, and six. And the reason for that is it's in our level of service. That's the area that we blanket spray. And we see plenty of uh, spot applications throughout the county as well. Uh, if we get a, an issue with weeds, we like to take care of them either through mowing or spraying. So, uh, Bed and shore sites along the Old Man River, uh, we inspect them. We pull some knapweed. Uh, mainly here we're using biocontrol agents where you can't spray. Uh, on uh, six leafy spurge sites in the county were, were given biocontrol agents. And the biocontrol agents, um, they take a long time to get established, but we're finding in the dry years, they do very, very well. So the leafy spurge uh, flea beetle we use is, is, is doing, doing its job. Um, as well, uh, the road top vegetation truck. So what we have here is a, a, a three ton truck that takes care of excess vegetation on the top of roads that aren't uh, heavily traveled so you don't have to grade them as much. So um, we did 250 miles there and, and those of you that have been around that that's a lower number than we had in the past. Normally you, you could see up to 400 miles and the reason there we're using a chemical that's working better. So normally we would do two passes with glyphosate. Now we're doing one pass with glyphosate and a, 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 a chemical that keeps the kosher from growing through it. It's actually not a herbicide. It's a, it's a, an agent that just stops them from coming through. A barrier product, I guess we'll call that. Uh, also, we had uh, 40 weed inspector consultations, and we had very good compliance. So uh, usually there's more uh, uh, inspections here, but what's happening over the years is we're constantly consultating with, with folks on their weed issues, and we've actually got the folks where they, they're just taking care of them and we don't have to bother them, which is great. Um, I should say too, I think there was four weed notices last year. Um, on one, w the process with the weed notice is, is that we give a weed notice and usually the farmer or resident will take care of the issue. In cases where they don't, we will either take care of it ourselves uh, or we'll hire a contractor to take care of it. And then if need be and the bill is not paid within 30 days that can be applied to their taxes. It's the same with soil erosion. If, if we give a soil erosion notice and they don't take care of it, we have to. We do what we have to do and then the charges go back to the, the farmer or the resident. So, uh, Moving on to pest control, the grasshopper sur survey of last year of course showed numbers uh, going high in some areas. Uh, areas of concern around here uh, up against Vulcan County in that Carmen Gay Barrens area. And uh, also the airport area had a, l a little few more than usual. And West Lethbridge, as you can see, uh, the les residents of Lethbridge had some, quite some issues. Uh, most of that farmland where there was an issue lies in the city of Lethbridge and it's not county owned land. So, and uh, what we do there is we go through every township in the county and we sweep for grasshoppers or do uh, grasshopper counts. And then those projections are used for the following year on what we think grasshoppers will be. And that's through the, uh, the Alberta agriculturists who we do that and they do the projections. So there are projecting higher numbers in some areas. And uh, we'll see it sometimes in a, a moi uh, moist year, moist spring, that'll, that'll lessen our the grasshoppers will will get a, a disease and that'll take care of them as well. Yeah, Ann? Just about grasshoppers, in some of our meetings with the City of Lethbridge, there's been some conversation about grasshoppers and we are doing joint public education with the city to get the people that are affected by it um, to understand a little bit more about the grasshopper and the grasshopper situation. So Jeremy's working with the city on that, so that'll be coming out shortly. Thank you for that. And, and Gary, would you say that it's uh, like, like the more the grasshoppers were uh, more in abundance uh, in the dryland areas? Certainly they were in the dryland areas in the south of the county. And we always see higher numbers in the south and the north in the dryland areas. So, And the airport areas. Airport area in particular in West Lethbridge is all dryland, mostly dryland too. So, 
Eric? Do we, uh, historically, do we participate in an actual spraying or uh, yeah, controlling of the grasshopper numbers, or are we just reporting? We're we're just reporting back uh, 40 years ago. They did we did have a program where we we used chemicals treatment. Uh, we have a in our level of service document that we'll discuss later. Uh, there is a portion there that allows the farmer to take care of the grasshoppers in the right of way if they sign off and if I approve it. Uh, some of the it would it has to be a brand formulation, not a spray. Uh, We've done that, and I've never had an application, so I think farmers are just, in some cases, just doing it. And like I say, it's it's in the dryland areas where there's less population, so it's getting done, I would imagine. Uh, Birth Arm Army Worm Survey was carried out in uh, 2021, and numbers were low in the areas that we surveyed, and we've attached the insect survey. I won't go through that. It's just an attachment for your purposes to, to look at what the the insect surveys that we've been doing, where they're at. Uh, bacterial ring rot, uh, that's a potato disease. We survey th through the potato growers. They give us the fields they'd like us to survey, and we do that. And that's a bad one if you ever get it. So, you know, we don't, we don't hope to find it, but we are out there monitoring and looking for it. And we'll do anywhere from six to ten fields. I think that number will increase with the, you know, uh, acres going up of potatoes in the area. Gary, so do do our farmers looking that for that constantly themselves too? Oh, yeah, all potato growers have agronomists that are looking for that. Uh, what what why we do it? It it's looked at uh, for export reasons, I believe. So if they're exporting uh, things, they like us to do these surveys. That a government agency is actually taking care of it. So. Can I make a comment? Yep. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, talking about uh, the ring rot and the potatoes or whatever down there, and uh, what the potato growers are really scared of is uh, the uh, residents must have a big garden and have potatoes, and I, I know of one of them down there. He, he lost all his potatoes last year because of in his yard never had potatoes in the fields or anything or anything close but he had it in his yard and he lost his potatoes and the potato growers are really scared of that 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 could be tracked into their fields for whatever reasons that is a very good uh, point to bring up they are concerned and they do have uh, educational programs out there of how to dispose of your waste don't go throwing it say you're on an acreage don't go throwing your your waste products in the farmer's field next door and uh, how you dispose of anything in the garden, including tomatoes and stuff like that, is important. So, we also did a survey for club root and black leg, and, and on our survey, there was no uh, club root found. And club root's another one that we want to keep out, so we're continuing to monitor for that for sure. Um, we'll, we'll they have that. It's uh, you know in central Alberta, that's it's a big deal with with club root as you go farther north, north of Highway 1, I guess. As well, uh, Strict 9, it's, it's no longer registered. Last year we cleaned up the 1,400 bottles that we had. We were able to, to provide everybody, just about everybody that phoned with, with the amount of Strict 9. The farmers have basically this year to use that Strict 9, the excess stuff they've had. So farmers are going to have to find alternatives to Strict 9. Currently, uh, the product that most are using is a product called Rosol, and that's where you have the feeding tubes out in the field, and you'll see, and it works good, but uh, gophers have to be controlled now. Yeah, once the grass gets green, they, don't, they won't take in that type of poison, so. We did hire a private trapper uh, for a couple weeks for rabies detection. He caught 10 skunks, and uh, if they see anything suspect, they'll send the heads to the ADRI to be you know, to, to see if there's any rabies in there, and none was found. And we do that in partnership with five municipalities in the south here that take part. Uh, we key in on most often the southern border or western border along Stafford. We believe if there's ever going to be rabies coming in, it's going to be from the U.S. So our Saskatchewan and you know, some of the other counties have that Saskatchewan already covered. So uh, as well, 
Uh, Diamond City area was surveyed for Dutch Elm disease. Uh, last year we had a private company come in and, and train us on what to look for for Dutch Elm because two trees were found in Lethbridge with Dutch Elm. So this is heavily on our radar. Um, we learned a lot from that training. Uh, these guys are the guys that detect it for Saskatchewan, a private company, and uh, they're really, really good. They never found any Dutch Elm, of course. They also did the Barrens area, which is not our jurisdiction, but they did that as well. So for this year, we're going to hire them. Last year they did it, uh, the Society to Prevent Dutch Elm paid for the survey. This year we will be paying to survey the Monarch area. So it, Monarch, every, it sits on one quarter section of land basically. We're going to survey that whole area and some of the farms that are adjacent to that quarter where Monarch sits. We will do a PR campaign when we get closer to that these guys will be knocking on your doors and, and asking to take samples if they see anything suspect. Uh, we, we really want to detect Dutch Elm disease before it ever gets established. And one of the things that I, we learned last year is that if you think you're, we get calls and we go look and, and we don't know as much as some of the professionals do, but if you have a tree that's showing any symptoms, there's a 95% chance approximately that tree will be dead the next year. So you'll know if you have it within the second year. But we're happy to look. We were also trained on how to take the samples, so we can send them in too if need be. Soil erosion, yeah. So, so soil erosion, of course, was an issue in 2021. Uh, in the beginning of the year, we saw large-scale wind events. Uh, we did some publications through social media, public service announcements, uh, the Sunny South News. We also hired uh, Farming Smarter did uh, four articles to promote what farmers can do for soil erosion. Uh, this year, no different than last year uh, for soil erosion, but some of the large farmers in the area went to winter wheat because they had the problem before. That helped themselves and that helped us all immensely. However, um, we did have a couple that we had to do some acting on. So one farmer, had a, his field was blowing and we got a call. I went and looked. I couldn't see 10 feet in front of the truck. We got a hold of him, told him he needed to do something now. I uh, said he couldn't. Um, we got the grader out there within an hour and a half. When I, when I went out there, when the grader got there, the farmer got out there with his rippers on his tractor. He had a perfect setup, small cultivator with rippers. We went in there with the grader. We ripped. We stopped that field from eroding in 45 minutes. Uh, so we're, we were happy with that. And then all the charges, of course, for the grader and stuff go back to that farmer. The key to soil erosion when you're doing it that way is low as you can get to bring up clods with the grader and slow. We did this in February. There was virtually, because the field wasn't farmed the year before, for whatever reason, there was no frost in the ground. Like we were, we sank the greater rippers as far as we needed to be, and at the very bottom, it brought up the, the odd clod. So uh, we were happy with the results there. We've been uh, getting a few issues with uh, neighbors complaining uh, about farm fields blowing. Uh, another case, we had to uh, we had a field blow, and it was affecting the adjacent landowner and it filled the ditch up to the culvert and the guy that you know the adjacent farmer he was willing to clean it out himself we told him no uh, we talked we, we med mediated an agreement where they brought in a private contractor and our public works department supervised to make sure the ditch wasn't you know or the drainage wasn't changed and they cleaned that ditch everybody involved was happy with with what happened there it got cleaned and then the, the farmer of course that had the land blowing he had to pay for those charges as well when we hear of uh, neighbors um, have issues with soil erosion we tell them the first step is to call your neighbor because if you call me and I call them it doesn't go over well sometimes so we try to mediate deals that everybody's happy where we're not creating neighbor problems so and they do happen, and uh, if we don't hear of them and we know that it blew onto somebody's yard, some, we're assuming that the neighbors are dealing with that together. So 
uh, and as well, compared to the jurisdictions in southern Alberta that have irrigated fields that have the soil erosion, we are the most aggressive in stopping soil erosion when it's happening. Some of them in the past haven't done anything at all. Uh, one county spent uh, upwards of 250000 to 500000 cleaning the ditches, and they do not bother the farmers, and they were just going to keep cleaning them out because that's the part of living in southern Alberta. For us, um, I've worked here for just about 30 years, and prior to myself, we've always taken the same approach. If your land is blowing, you need to have it stopped. However, we're in a different time right now, and in some cases, it's uh, wind events. Uh, there's not a lot. Like we're, We have soil blowing through stubble. I mean, what can you do about that? If, a, if someone goes out there and works that, they're going to make it worse. So we have to take a common sense approach. And, you know, it, it's the guys that uh, every year we have an issue with soil erosion or if I tell them to do something and nothing happens, those are the folks that we are willing to give a soil erosion notice and have them clean up, clean up the ditch, right? Okay. Uh, Lauren, do you want to ask your question, maybe? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I just want to go back to the gopher thing, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, do you have many people using anhydrous ammonia or one of those uh, CO2 pumps? Is that, do you see that very often? or Anhydrous, no. I think people have got away with the risks there. Uh, the CO2 pump, I think you're talking about a little machine that thr throws carbon dioxide. Yeah. yeah, so we have one of those that we, we use on our parks. It's not effective. It takes too long per hole. You're looking at uh, 10 minutes per hole. And if you're a, in a field situation, it just ain't going to work for you. Another product that we use is mustard. So not mustard gas. It's mustard that, that c comes out of a, a sprayer in a foam. So you foam down the holes, and the gophers get a whiff, it, whiff of it, and they suffocate. That's what we're using on our parks and cemeteries now. It wouldn't be practical for large-scale farms either if you have a, a real problem because of the cost. It's, it's, it's expensive to do, and it's labor-intense labor as well. So the Rosol, and there's, a couple, there's one more other product I'm not familiar with that uh, we would never recommend because it's, uh, you put it down and it has the ability to gas off later. You, you don't want that, right? You, random gassing off, so. Hmm. Yeah. Lord? Well, I, I know the one you're talking about, a lot of people used it's phostoxin or, or something like that. Uh, yeah, not a good idea. <laughs> phostoxin is registered, and we, tra we do the farmer pesticide course, and that's a component that you, we can train, and they can use that method, but I, I don't usually recommend that one for the obvious reason. It, it's, it's a dangerous gas, and uh, I, th I think, you know, strychnine was, was, in my opinion, it's deadly to secondary kills. However, strychnine is not going to hurt you, whereas the, the applicator can be hurt by some of these gases, right? Yeah. Just a question that you put probably more to it aware of it than what we are. Why, what, what was the big reason to ban strychnine? They had a study that was about 100 pages long on why strychnine shouldn't be allowed, and it is 100% on secondary poisoning. So uh, gopher dies, neighbor's dog eats, eats the gopher and dies as well. And it wasn't even the secondary poisoning of neighbor's dogs and those sorts of things. It was secondary poisons. They consider uh, non-target being a mouse when it's registered for Richardson ground squirrel, our magpie, our coyote. So that, that's likely what the, where most of the secondary poisonings were, were, were scavenger animals. Wasn't the, wasn't in my opinion, that, the, you know, that was a pretty low risk. That's my opinion. Back uh, about 20 years ago, uh, strychnine uh, lost how we were able to sell it. We sell it in the bottle and you mix it yourself the last 10 years. Previous to that, we were having to use a premixed product and uh, someone else, a private contractor, did it for us and then we were selling those buckets. So gopher population surged in Saskatchewan and the pressure 
towards the government changed and we needed to bring it back because the farmers the far it ha something had to happen it's likely going to happen again I'm not sure the federal government will change their stance we wrote a letter everybody wrote a letter that we needed strict nine and it was it fell on deaf ears nothing happened so yeah it's just too bad that they don't uh, you know look at uh, what uh, what happens in in uh, in practice because I mean like all of our counties and MDs would have uh, probably better uh, sight on what's going on than anybody else than the government does in that uh, in that case um, John Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to touch base a little bit on soil erosion. Are we talking just out of fields? Because, um, <clears throat> and asking more on a personal note, because we do have some, the ditch in front of our place constantly gets filled from erosion, but it's coming up through the coolies. So is that something that, uh, because that land is privately owned, but I, I don't see any way of stopping that, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, so the Soil Erosion Act is is for agriculture land. I do get phone calls and you know sometimes it's the majority in a year where it's acreage owners that are are have the issue. And in one case uh, about a month ago, it, the guy had 7 acres of land in an, in an acreage setting that was blowing on to a to another fellow's beautiful acreage and I, I we we, medi we mediated a deal there as well, where the guy would was went in and he took care of all the. It, w it wasn't a soil erosion problem, I, like we normally see. There was a skiff on his lawn, and that was concerning to him. And I told him that this is not a soil erosion issue. This is a uh, inconvenience issue. Like it, that's what it is. So needless to say, we did broker a deal where everybody was hap happy as well. We do. We'll talk to farmers and make everybody happy and, and try to get the situation resolved. In most cases, they do. Like I say, though, the first call should always be neighbor to neighbor because when I get involved, a lot of people really don't like it. Eric? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Could you speak on uh, manure application to prevent erosion? Um, dry manure, it seems to be effective in the fields. I've seen it. Is it something we promote or uh, uh, as part of these fields, even the stubble fields versus working them? few loads of manure seems to go a long ways yes so we we are promoting those practices and it's through those uh, um, articles that through farming smarter and as well I think at least in the last year we've put on social media we also do a public service announcement and then we attach on what farmers can do to stop soil erosion so it's it's important to note that if you're spreading manure manure on frozen ground you have to get that the NRCB has to let you but if you phone their office it's my understanding if it's because soil erosion it's it, they will they will approve that so yes it certainly does work and <laughs> a funny note I made the other day because everybody's trying to stop soil erosion I said they're gonna run out of manure because everybody's <laughs> putting on a lot this year yeah. of course they're making new stuff every day too so So with soil erosion, when we go through our level of service, we will go exactly the process that I follow, and uh, we'll, we'll go through a, li a little bit more. If there, is there any more questions at this point? The past two years have been exceptionally brutal for soil erosion. Um, we're hoping we have a wet year and we have better stubble left out there. It's very dry right now. And uh, when farmers seed this year, it is going to be, it's, it's making me nervous and it's probably making them nervous. On dry land fields, when the seed goes in, you know what it looks like and it could blow. And, and in that case, Am um, I going to go out there and tell 40 farmers to start ripping the field they just seeded? Probably not because everybody's in it, in it, right? Uh, last year we had um, what was more just affecting one a large farm area and they had seeded winter wheat and I'd, I'd, I'd said 
you know, you need to go in there and stop the soil erosion. And they're saying, and they agreed. They said the the the, the crop was up, and you're a little bit spotty, and and their seed was blowing out of the ground. So there was no reason that they couldn't go in there, and they did. And they got in a little bit too late because had they gone in earlier, it was affecting five fields out in the west end of the county. Uh, they would have saved their fields that were further east. So they learned that you know that, that they could have been more, a little bit more proactive. And uh, also we're seeing a lot of um, manure going on in the fall and folks are doing what they have to do. It's the ones that are taking an extra year to, to learn that lesson. Nobody thought we we're going to be dry for two years in a row and who knows how long it will be. So bad, bad couple of years. Moving forward, roadside seating. So the Ag Service Board does the roadside seating of any shoulder poles or construction work uh, mm -hmm. that we do. And uh, we also do the, the rock removal, disking, that sort of thing. Equipment rental. Uh, Brilliant Drills is our, our main rental here. Uh, the costs are five an acre or $150 minimum. The last two years, we've seen about the exact same revenue. It's $3,750. These machines cost us. I think they were sixteen thousand dollars each. They've we bought new ones five years ago. They're paying for themselves. Of course, there is a cost to uh, you know to haul them out to, to each area. But we're likely. I'm likely going to ask for an increase uh, in what we charge in the schedule fees. So we're going to probably try to up that to a two hundred dollar minimum. It just the price of everything is up. Fuel it costs more to to get it there. So. Uh, farmers are happy with these units because they're they're new. Uh, plastic baler use. So this is last year I'm talking. We seen incredible use last spring of the plastic baler. They had some initiatives. Uh, Clean Farms had a compressor that they were using to for silage plastic as well. This year, it has not been out once, and the reason being, there was no need for a grain bag in a drought. I mean, everybody had enough bin space, right? So. The uh, silage plastic compactors, they have them in, I believe, Picture Butte and Iron Springs. There's a number of these units. There has not been a very good uptake on these through Clean Farms. Uh, clean Farms uh, called me and asked me if we would basically take over their program of uh, promoting it. The ones that they give to producers, they give four of them out and let them keep them. Those guys are using them and they're compacting their plastics. but. As far as coming to pick one up from Iron Springs or Picture Butte, it's just not happening. So uh, we're going to try to promote it for them and help them out and get, and get that working. And it, it may be that they have to give more of these units uh, units out, or we have to have a tutorial on how producers can use them and get some, you know, get get it going in the right direction. So, Eric, that uh, the plastic compactor from. Uh clean farms uh, that's a lot of manual labor it's a cable up and it's push it in put the pin in very manual I could see quite easily that guys are not going to go through the effort to go grab one they got to be very much devoted to recycling before they're going to put that effort in that's a very good point and also they have to save their plastic so you have to have a good area to save your plastic to get enough to compact and with the wind we have and saving plastic, you better have a pretty secure area or it's going to end up in Saskatchewan. So, At the CARE conference, we, uh, we had, they gave a demonstration on how to use it and everything like that. And, uh, but it's, it's, like Eric said, it's an awful lot of labor. Uh, and I think that's probably one of the reasons why people are not doing it more than they should. Because, you know, there's a lot of plastic going into the landfill that shouldn't be going in there. And... Uh, you know, if we could find a way that uh, would people would be using these things more, that would be good. that would be a great idea. Yeah, and and I think our role will help just because we're closer connected to the farm community than Clean Farms is, right? So, and when they first initially got going with this, uh, I give them a list of where he could take them and where guys would use them, so that they're not connected to the they're they're from the city, and they're not from Southern Alberta, but. Yeah, and then of course you've got the other ones with the, uh, even the silex plastic itself, so some people are, are doing that, but the majority of the silex plastic is just too dirty and they don't want to take it. So I mean, that, that's the other, uh, another reason why it, it's, it's not working the way it should. 
there, there is a video out there on, on yeah on a few of these things but yeah we need to promote it better and I think what we need to have is a day where we we go out and well we don't know how to use it so we need to to learn that as well and then that we can show farmers and right now COVID has just stopped any in in-person training right so hopefully in the future things switch around here so any more questions on plastic moving on to parks so uh, parks playground and shop maintenance is ongoing it's a part of our work uh, in 2020 most of our parks are dryland parks uh, come August there was not a lot of effort needed so because of that we had budget allotment that we used for benches tables uh, and we, we put them out uh, amenities we'll call them in several communities including Diamond City Fairview Shaughnessy and Mountain Meadows when we put in a new table a new bench whatever we put in people phone and thank us they appreciate the work that is being done in the parks uh, over the last year we've done a lot of upgrades in parks and for the coming year Monarch is going to see a playground upgrade you've likely seen it on social media we've worked with the community of Monarch and they're going to get a really nice park this year that park will be built at the end of May first week of June is when we're intending weather and, and other factors uh, can come into play on social media we've got exceptional feedback from the residents that are excited about the the opportunity to have a new park so uh, also just recently I started working with the community of Shaughnessy and the community association there uh, we're planning a playground for 2023 I just got uh, a couple prospective playgrounds that that we're going to put in uh, these playgrounds are not cheap or they're not inexpensive they, they, there's a cost to this and uh, when we put these in we're hoping they will be there and enjoyed for 25 to 30 years Morris yeah thank you mr. chairman maybe you can touch on uh, for a minute uh, how many of these uh, parks and playgrounds we really have in a county and the reasons for that I am asking if you have uh, some of the neighboring municipalities I'm not going to name it which one it is but they made one time a comment you know well we got our parks and playgrounds in our uh, community to take care of you guys don't have that as of just a minute you know and so it would be nice to bring it up for a minute but what we all have in the county okay we'll go off my memory and off the spot here so we have one in turn we have one in iron springs we have one in shaughnessy we have one in diamond city there's one in Monarch, there's one in Sunset Acres, there's a trail system in Mountain Meadows, and there's a trail system at the Broxburn Park. I believe I, oh, we have one more in Fairview. Did you say Diamond City? Yes, yep. Yep. Yeah, so. Yeah, that would be the community that takes care of that one. And they also, you know, the Shaughnessy Community Association, that is their playground. We only monarch the same thing. We only deal with playgrounds that are on county-owned land. And the grant that we give out, it states now that it has to go on county-owned land. So the, the one in Monarch is going where the baseball diamond is. Just, uh, it'll be to the east of that. And? And for the new members of council too, because we had a very onerous uh, process for community associations to get funding for various things. So what council decided about two years ago, I believe, was that we would give every community association $10,000 in our budget. So that's a way for them to kind of upgrade and keep these properties in good shape. So just a note on those that for the, those that are new um, we've been giving this grant out for I think five years we've got more aggressive before that there was no money available or that was allocated the use of our parks has gone up incredible incredibly rather um, Sunset Acres got a park a couple of years ago and the city folks are coming to use the county parks now and some of the folks out there didn't like it because you know they didn't want to share but it was a COVID thing 
uh, people were trying to spread out from the city. So I think now that it, the rules have loosened that a lot of the, you know, people are going back to using the city parks as well. But it's a good thing. I, I, it doesn't matter to me. I just like to see children out there using the parks, and that, that's what they're intended for. So so with um, Monarch, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on it a little bit. Not only are we getting the, a, a great park playground, we're going to overseal the tennis court put up new basketball standards and we think we'll see more use there as well so uh, the one uh, that's coming for Shaughnessy um, we're trying to get a grant through the provincial government the community association is so they can they can get a little more money to, to do a little more there the tennis court in Shaughnessy is not in great shape it's going to cost we're, it needs to be redone the fence needs to be looked at uh, that's going to that's going to be one of the large expenses there as well as the play equipment uh, it does see use through the hockey the county gave a grant many years ago for a curb cement curb there's a fellow there that puts in ice and it is used heavily in the winter there's a group that plays pickleball in the community hall and they have they're full like they they play Tuesdays and Thursdays and they're not accepting new people to come they're going to have to make more time available. So on that tennis court, we will be putting hopefully two pickleball courts so that they can play it outdoor as well. Currently, they're using it in the gymnasium at the school, the old school. Okay. Moving on, uh, our cemeteries were, were mowed twice. Same thing as our dry land parks. I think some of you have seen our cemeteries. They're very dry areas. Some of them it's native grass. We like to make them look good going into winter. So it was touch and go whether they needed to be done, but I think the community appreciates if we if we keep them nice. So uh, moving on, the farm family. The 2022 Calgary Stampede, uh, our nominee for this year is the Vanden Hazel. Fend and Allison. Oh, yes, I mistake that twice. I, I seems like I'm constantly mixing their name <laughs> up. So, is Vanden and and Allison? Yeah, my mistake. I'm sorry. Thank you for bringing that up. I just can't get it straight. <laughs> well, he's not. He's not farming anymore. Either. No. <laughs> so they farm in the ready-made area, and, and they've been there since the '70s. So they've been uh, farming since the 70s, and they're a very deserving family for that, for sure. Um, farm safety, every year we give a $5,000 donation to uh, the Farm Safety Center, and they this year they provided uh, training or their program to 2,143 students. Normally it's in school, this year at virtual format. They've had to adapt how they do things. Uh, I've attached the farm safety report. We won't go through that, but uh, you can read through that if, if you want to have a little more, more information. Other activities, uh, we could not have a shelter belt in-person training, so we put some videos. We hired a contractor, eight shelter belt videos on our website. They've been accessed a lot. So people do see the value. This last week on Monday, we had a virtual shelter belt uh, training with uh, folks from the city and also a, a contractor it was very well received and and the and the the, the folks that took part uh, they learned a lot about shelter belts so as well we attended Ag Expo this year as an exhibitor Ag Expo was slow this year uh, it wasn't just our booth there was less people that come in because of covid but we were very happy to be there and and meet some of the the, the farmers and and folks from the county uh matthew attended uh, he does a, a little bit of our rural extension uh farming smarter we were a, a sponsor there of a thousand dollars and we also put up our booth there uh, we held a farmer pesticide course just a few weeks ago 26 people in attendance uh that's a lot uh, we have, uh, I would say, two-thirds were from the county. Others come in from the Endia Tabor, some own land here. Also, they haven't done a lot of work with it in the county of 40 Mile. 
So Bill Hammond helps us out with that. And Bill went over to 40 Mile and he trained 35 people over there and then some of their overflow because they were a little behind come to Lethbridge County. And we're happy to fill that void. There's other counties that help us out in, in other ways as well. So uh, the South Region Conference was held in Cardston. There's a few, a few of us that attended that. There were 40 individuals in attendance. That was in October. Normally there's 120, so COVID again. The Ag Service Board Conference was in Edmonton. There were nearly 400, so 370 some is, think is what they had their last number. Normally there's up to 650. I think it's part COVID, of course, and also part that municipalities just don't have the funding to send people is what, what I'm hearing, so. Uh, future conferences, next year it will be in Grand Prairie. We've had it there before, um, a little bit further to go. And the following year, the South Region will be the host. I'm on the committee that is uh, selecting where it, the venue. So we're looking at venues and we're, we have to look at price and where we can get a, an economical deal. We're looking heavily at the uh, Lethbridge Exhibition Grounds and we sure would like to have it in Lethbridge and we think that facility will be awesome. But to keep things, uh, you know, to be accountable, we have to look at other areas. So we're, we're looking at Calgary. The last time we hosted it was in downtown Calgary. Also, it was, it was well received in downtown Calgary, but uh, we're more rural here in Lethbridge. And for the speaker committee, all the agriculture folks at the research state, there's a lot of speakers that can be, uh, that can present that live in southern Alberta and we won't have to pay the big, you know, flying them in from wherever. So Lethbridge is, to me, of course, I'm going to promote that to the committee hard and our, the committee is very open t to Lethbridge. We're going to go meet with them in about a week and a half and we'll, we'll discuss costs and, and things like that. Okay. And? Just wondering, Gary, I, I'm, have you had a tour of the new facility yet of the new exhibition here? Because I think I'm going next week and I'd be more than happy for you to come with me if you wanted to see it and then you could kind of push yeah. for it. Yeah, so we're meeting as a committee on... Uh, on with it, and you're going to have a tour? Yeah, we're going to have a tour oh, good. on... It will be the following Monday of next week. Oh, so good. We're excited to see what they got. I, I've seen the plans on paper. And... Uh, and they've hired some good people that are promoting it. It's it's there. It's it was going to be a beautiful facility, and it, it it would be great if the agriculture service boards take note that the the reason they're building that facility is for it to to get conferences just like this one. And this would be a great way to kind of kick it off with with something from the county, right? Yeah, and I think that well, a couple of years ago we had it in Calgary, but I think uh, you know we we've got to put the emphasis on having it back in the rural areas because I think that uh, will promote it a lot better than that you're in the middle of a city. Absolutely, and we've had it in Medicine Hat when the South Regions hosted, and Lethbridge never had the hotel capacity that we had to bus people, and there'd be a little bit of busing here as well from hotels, but. And. Normally, uh, if 650, we had Medicine Hat a few years back. Oh yes, it's it depending on what, what else is going on in town yeah. at that time. We have to work it out so that maybe we're the only event at that time. It, it, you know, there, there's certainly lots of hotels, uh, but there was no facility. So the old exhibition grounds, we did host it in Lethbridge once, and it was the, the facilities weren't as great as they're going to be. And Medicine Hat had it. They, it's one stop shopping when you go to these small places. Like Lethbridge is going to have the caterer, they're going to have the sound system. There's a lot involved to putting on these conferences. And uh, for instance, uh, in Calgary, uh, when you get microphones and uh, the system to, to, to tape it and all that stuff, you're, you're looking at upwards of $30,000 to, to do that in Lethbridge. I'm hoping it's not that, not, not that when they, they'll, they'll own the equipment themselves. And? 
we are just in the, the process of getting moving and uh, we do reach out to the tourism and and when we meet with the folks at the exhibition I think they'll direct us in the, in the right areas so when we went to Calgary we dealt with the tourism Calgary and they helped up putting it on and there was some big savings that they were able to you know pre-negotiate for for having it in downtown Calgary when we had it in Calgary times were very slow for Calgary because of the oil was in the gutter so yeah and uh, Aaron Crane would be an excellent person to to help you there she'd be really excited to be involved in that yeah yep, thank you and I'll get those names off you guys after and we'll, we'll certainly I'll reach out I'll send you an email invite and introduce yourself perfect that sounds great so moving on, resource management stream. So this is a separate funding stream for our Ag Service Board grant, which we get $91,000. Uh, this area is covered mainly by an employee we have. His name is Matthew Wells. Uh, started on this about just over a, about a year, I guess. He's hit the ground running, and, he's, and we're really out there promoting agriculture in the county. So I will go through. I'm not going to go through all the details, but I'll tell you what we're doing, and, and we'll, we'll go through that. So... Uh, we've got a new newsletter and we've rebranded it Rural Living and Egg Extension. Uh, we decide what goes in it by committee of myself, Matthew, <laughs> Assistant Fieldman, Derek Vance, and, and uh, our communications coordinator, Matty Elliott, is a big part of this as well. I, we think it is a big upgrade from the newsletters that we've had before. We're reaching a broader audience. We've put in gardening stuff uh, I hope you've seen it and we we would like feedback it doesn't have to be now but we want to know how we're doing if there's something more interesting you guys are in the community uh, if, if you ever have feedback send it through through to Ann and, and we'll be happy to address some some more you know positive articles that we can do we try to reach out to all sectors of agriculture and if we haven't reached your sector We'll hopefully get there. Barley, sugar beets, potatoes, milk. We, we, we've, we've done them all. So we enjoy that. It, it's taken up a little bit of our time to rebrand it, and, and more work certainly goes into it. The feedback we're getting from the community is very, very positive on that. As well, so we, we, we've got into this floating island uh, deal at Broxburn Park. So they got the, the ponds there from the, for the storm water. So what we're doing is uh, we're putting these floating islands that can clean up the water quality. They're not established yet. We're trying to establish them, and we're we're uh, it's the new thing. Olds College is doing it. The uh, Lethbridge Community College, I think, may be getting into these as well. So we're testing the water, seeing how the, these will work on cleaning up that storm water because it can't be released unless it meets a certain quality. Uh, in the past, we'd put uh, products in there that are chemical chemicals are not looked at positively we also do the aeration so the aeration does clean it up you have to run those things for large hours in a day and the, and the cost of electricity is is expensive so some of the other things uh, Matthew has gone to uh, Lethbridge College and he's he's done some work there uh, discussing that Broxburn site as well uh, me and Matt also went to the college and we in, we did a little course on I I you know did a presentation on uh, the Weed Control Act. It was it was well received and then Matthew of course talked about his extension activities as well. Okay, uh, just a minute. Eric. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Our floating islands, are they are we funding this and the, the college is instituting it or is the college got a grant that benefiting us and if so to what extent are we funding it so we had some donated to us by a resident in the county is where this idea got going and so we put those in and then we decided because we had budget uh, money we, we we put them in ourselves at our cost so we need I think the number 16 of these units in there to, to do do its its proper work and what we're doing is we're going to showcase these to feedlots in their stormwater ponds and if it becomes a viable and it works so we want to prove it can works and then it's an option and uh, of course our funding here is a lot of it the funding comes from the provincial government so it, that's where, where it's covered it's uh, I Ninety-one thousand dollars, like I said, comes from the province on these, and and we have a um, ESB grant, so it stipulates what we uh, must do. 
So if we put in there that we're doing these things, we have to we have to do them. And we've added this last year. That we would like this added to our grant. That this is one of one of the things that we could do. Lord, the college is not uh, uh, funding it currently. Uh, we are making uh, headway with you know we're getting to know the college and all the folks involved there. Maybe one day that's a possibility. And Olds College, if you if you look online, uh, Olds College is is really looking into these and the, the research is is being done mainly through Olds College. But I know Lethbridge College wants to get involved somehow too. Lord, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I <coughs> just was wondering about uh, Stewart Siding. The Three Pond Lagoon there. Is the water cl fairly clean there compared to Broxburn? Does that work as well as this uh, floating island thing, or is that a place that you would use this system to? Yeah, those are large, and, uh, and what we've created there a long time ago was a wetland. So wetlands are natural filters. So also at the Broxburn <laughs> area, you know, it's clean. We're trying to get some cattails going because that's a filter as well. That will be the best bang for the buck, uh, but yeah, I, I'm not. We're, we're not involved with testing that water. So what happens there is when the storm come, water comes in, and then they must somebody from environment I think is testing because it's released into the canal once it gets so high. We haven't had uh, much to do with that for for 20 years in that area. Or do, thank you. The only reason I ask is because sometimes when we have a, a flooding event, that whole thing gets completely flooded out. So. I just wasn't sure of the quality of the water you had left after that because it's all mixed up then. not doesn't flow through the system. Yes, it's not doing its job. So, yeah, I, I can look into that. And I'm interested myself to find out the, the, who's involved with l releasing that water now. So I'll look into that one. Lord, take over. So a part of our rural extension is presentations. So obviously we're giving lots of uh, presentation on the floating islands. Just here a little while ago, I sent two employees, including Matthew, to the college. They wanted to see our equipment. So we took our big sprayer and showed, showed them what, how the county does things. So, and also the weed control act when we presented on that. We wanted to have the next generation know what kind of weeds we're looking at. and. It, it, they were we give out the little weed books that we we give out at Ag Expo and they were they were very interested so uh, also we're looking at getting into high schools and doing a little bit of training on on what we do and promoting the agri agriculture industry that way as well raptor posts so Fortis Alberta was going to help us with a couple raptor posts but since this printed Fortis Alberta backed out we think that it's coming they will help us um, I'm not sure why, if it's an organization or a budget thing, but uh, they they're, they were excited that we're going to put it down at the Rackus Pit, so where we have our tours for the riparian area, that we'd have something else to show as well to producers for gopher control. And uh, we're also getting into uh, mountain bluebirds. We're just putting some, trying to attract them. This is not a big part of our program, but it's something else to showcase uh, environmentally to people when we have a tour down there again when COVID allows us to. So informing the public, uh, in general, our Ag Service Board, uh, we put out a lot of information on social media. We don't want to monopolize it, but we think agriculture is the biggest thing we got going in Lethbridge County. So we're, we're giving lots of material to uh, the communications coordinator. Uh, some of that includes uh, each week we have uh, what's that weed and what's that bug we're going to continue on with that uh, I mean everything has its its day we'll, we'll continue that until people aren't interested anymore and hopefully go on to something new but if you're linked to our social media you're seeing stuff from the Ag Service Board weekly uh, we promote our brilliant drills we, we do whatever we can through that environmental farm plans uh, Matthew Wells was trained up on on delivering environmental farm plans Lethbridge County is the biggest deliverer of environmental farm plans in the province. Alan can call me on that if I'm wrong. <laughs> so we're very busy with that. And the reason being um, milk producers have what they called um, have here, pro-action, which makes them, they, they must have an environmental farm plan. All their environmental farm plans are due, say, everybody's phoning us 
my environmental farm plans due next week. Well, it's rushing out there to help them. Uh, the milk producers actually have the ability to find their producers if they don't give their environmental farm plans on time. Other organizations are going to come, potato growers may come through this way where everybody's going to need an environmental farm plan. This is a very busy portion of, of what we're doing. These, these calls are coming in weekly. I'm um, called, Math, Matthews uh, gets asked if he could do them in the MD Tabor, County Warner, and I just tell him no, it's, it's within our boundaries or you must own land in our, in our county is how we handle that. And uh, like I say, they're, they're coming in every day. CAP funding, that goes along. That's a Canadian Agriculture Partnership funding, which allows producers to get funding for certain projects. When they do the environmental farm plan, sometimes there's some areas that they need to improve. Sometimes there's funding. So Matt's becoming an expert on that, on where to lead farmers to the proper funding as well. We put uh, this program in charge of the... Uh, beetle drops for leafy spurge so we're going to be putting six beetle drops out this year we're also going to be partnering with uh, Alberta Invasive Species Council and uh, some other counties Newell will be one of them we're going to make some videos on integrated pest management when it comes to leafy spurge it's a big issue here the beetles work we want producers to know what they can do so we're going to make a video and we're going to promote it through the Alberta and Species Invasive Species Council and our website as well. So hopefully we can get that done this summer. They were happy, all partners are happy to be involved with that. So we do have some watershed groups that we work with. The main one is the the Old Man uh, yes, River hold on, Main hold Street. Hold on a minute, I think uh, Lauren's got a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the, uh, the beetles, do they survive the winter or is it something you have to do every year? They do survive the winter and uh, it's not something you have to do every year. We've been releasing beetles in, in Lethbridge County for uh, approximately 35 years. There's different agents that we put out over the years. We still find the old ones. The flea beetles do survive and so we had a, an, an individual that lived down in the river valley that wanted to purchase, you can purchase your own as well. So she was pressuring us to put one of our sites down along the river of her property. So we brought in the folks that drop them. We swept for numbers. You said, you don't need to buy any, and you don't need to do anything here. What they would suggest, you take a sweep net and you move them. So you move them another 100 feet. And in the past, it took so long to get these, these working, but the flea beetles are establishing in 5 to 10 years where they're, where they're taking some of the spurge out. Uh, I've visited some of the river valleys uh, that I visited when I first started with the county. The leafy spurge numbers are less since we stopped spraying every, as much as we could. Uh, it was never a good place to, to apply chemical, and we stopped doing it, and 30 years later there's less than, a, at least that I can remember now, so something's acting on them. So the Old Man River uh, Watershed Group, Matthew's involved with that. We had a meeting down in the River Valley, uh, out in that, uh, just on the, the south side of the river in the east part of the county. Uh, we're very well received. I think we had 20 people. We all, we invited all sorts of folks. of all Alberta and Species, Invasive Species Council, cows and fish, multi-star. It was great to connect everybody and the folks that own the the land along the river, many attended and it was well received on what they can do and we, we hope to have more of those. A big event that we had uh, was the nutrient management webinar. This is the second year we had this online event for January 24th, 31st and the 7th. Uh, we, we, we did this with the County of Newell and County Warner, but we did all the work. We, we used that to promote through them uh, the fieldman out in uh, Newell is good at promoting. So we, we had 509 individuals sign up. And it's not only from North America, it's all over the world. What we're going to try a little harder on this year is connecting more of our producers. There was There's some, but it, it is valuable because they get the, uh, the agronomists get the continuing edu education credits. So this is redundant. Of course, Matt attended the Farming Smarter uh, Ag Expo as well and they hosted that shelter belt uh, program. And then uh, 
you started putting together we, we do, do plan on doing some tours uh, with college and university on our riparian area that's why we're building it up so that we can have something to see we do not plan on doing a producer uh, public tour this year because COVID would not allow us to plan and we didn't want to put out expenses when we didn't know what it could be and when we do have a new tour another tour we're, ho we're hoping to we want to make it make it different uh, all the tours in the past have been really good we want to involve others maybe farming smarter uh, maybe we can uh, have a barbecue event uh, evening uh, we're, we're, we're thinking bigger because we haven't had it it might be it might be a good deal so you know also Matt's been working with cows and fish to have a, a field day and we've had one of them last year uh, he also does the agroclimatic uh, climate agroclimate impact report so that's just weather reports each uh, month and then we do have the water sites that the riparian area that we're still putting out between assistant fieldman Derek Vance and Matt they 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 put out the uh, watering system which helps promote uh, beneficial practices for for that sort of thing and that is uh, my report there are a couple attachments but like I said you can go go through those at your your own time Morris yeah, just to comment on that their uh, farming smaller conference but was uh, there uh, Gary I, I thought we were as a council maybe register for it but anyways and it's my fault too I should have checked a little closer but we weren't and it was no counselors down there at all we had a boot down down there but anyways I was there for the two days and so was uh, Tory and we paid it out of our own pocket to be down there but there was a few other municipalities they had their counselors down there and uh, to show support towards agriculture I guess and so for next year if they're going to have it again I uh, would like to see that uh, us as a county we're going to have some reps some counselors down down there in the in the past we have sent yeah. uh, folks to both the farming smarter and the uh, Tiffin conference uh, those requests recent years have not come through the Ag Service Board they've come through I believe the invitations uh, maybe Ann could speak better on that one Ed? Yeah, I apologize because that fell through the cracks. We don't know where the invitation went, and I suspect that because a few years were cancelled, but we'll make sure, Councillor Zienstra, that that gets corrected for next year and it comes forward. Okay, any more questions for uh, Gary? <coughs> Well, Gary, I want to thank you. That was a really extensive uh, report you had today here, and uh, it was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, so can I have a mover to uh, accept this information? Uh, Lauren? Everybody in favor? That's carried. So you guys want a five-minute break? <coughs> then we'll go five-minute break. Be back here at uh, 10, to, 10, to, 10, 10.
and uh, welcome to here. We haven't uh, seen you for a little bit, but you're, uh, it's good to see you again. And uh, I would say, take the floor. Thanks, Klaus. Uh, so we, we do these organizations once every four years. No, not once every four years. Upon request. So Gary, I work with him very closely. So once a year during the program, the funding program, Gary puts in a report. And uh, he's lucky that I'm always here. So if he misses something, I just call him and say, hey, Gary, you're understood yourself. You did more than you. You're recording. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Alan, could you maybe just kind of touch on, for the new people, on the difference kind of between the Ag Service Board versus the RMA? And I think <coughs> a lot of people get confused when they first get on the Ag Service Board about, like, a RMA is more of a, a lobbyist type board, whereas Ag Service Board is kind of more the governance style rather than a, being a lobbying agent. Yeah, so, yeah, so. When I come here, I spend more time with Gary a lot because he's the administrator of the app. But when I'm here, I'm having a conversation so that you are more accurate in the governance of the app. So legally, the ASB is the governance body of the ASB app in a local municipality or local authority. You are the governing body of the app or of acts under the app. So the act is the ASB act, and under that the solar diagram, we have the wind control act, we have the soil conservation act, and we have the uh, agricultural test act. Those two, three acts are right under the ASB act. And then we also assist with the animal health act. So you are the governing body of the act that advises the council. You advise the council, the council put the check mark and you're good to go. And if there's a mix up in most areas when you have a meeting and that meeting is ASB, in some areas when they're not careful, they're making decisions that the council is supposed to be making under the ASB meeting and that's not proper. So you have to take the your ASB hat off and put on the council make those council decisions. When you put on the ASB card, you are in an advisory position to the council. Is that? And I don't understand about the rural municipality, but, but Bowen does. I, I, I think the most confusing, well, might as well, uh, the most confusing part to me was the two, op, the two don't function quite the same. Whereas I, I explained the the RMA is kind of a lobbyist to the provincial government, mm -hmm. whereas the Egg Service Board is uh, I wouldn't call them a, exactly a lobbyist, but more of a governance type board under the auspices of the uh, of the minister. Yeah. Uh, well, whereas, yeah. yeah. So you you don't quite. You, you can't, it, they don't function the same way. They and don't, I, yeah. and I, I, I found that kind of hard to understand when I first was on. And I, because I could figure it out, you go to a convention and you talk about things, and well, just because it gets passed doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be, it's not going to be lobbied for. It's, yeah. it's, it's not the same thing. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. So, yeah. so, yeah, so when you look at the advisory side of things, uh, as an ASB, you have different avenues of influencing both the local policy, local authority policy, and also the provincial policy. So when you work through the uh, regionally, you have resolutions. You come up with a resolution that be initiated by you guys in a local level. And then you debate those resolutions at a regional level. And if they pass, they move on to so that's another one avenue of influencing the policy all the way to the provincial level. And 
apropos, you guys being a government, non scanso. I'm assuming you guys are all scanso, right? Right? Yeah. So the council is the governing, and the CEO is the administrator. The council gives the CEO mouth, so managing orders, and they don't interfere in every day work of the CEO. But CEO reports to the council what's going on. You guys should be at, at uh, governing of the act. You give direction. If you do your not elect officials, you give advisory direction to the council. And once the council approves it, then it becomes it. And you give, you guide. Those directions you give, guide, carry, move forward as an administrator and inspector. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so in other places <coughs> have gone, you find that the governing team is also involved in the nitty gritty things as they were made in most of the market. You know, they give direction, leave it alone. I don't care what they were saying. Give me direction, leave it alone. <laughs> <laughs> so, are there uh, any more questions for Alan? Well, Policy, yeah. questions? If not, Alan, I really want to thank you for uh, the presentation that you made, and uh, it was a great, great report, and I think we all, uh, all learned something again. Yeah. And uh, you're welcome to stay for lunch, because I think we, uh, lunch is coming in at about 10 to 12, and uh, you can join us there, and uh, 
then we will move on and uh, ask Gary to come forward to give the uh, the level of service uh, agriculture report. Excellent. And you guys, I'm a local guy. I've been here for a long time. I used to do irrigation. Now I'm in this week with you guys. I'm enjoying my work. You can pick up a phone in four minutes time and ask me a question. And I respond to you. Yeah, he's you just know. living s south in the l l south of Lethbridge there. No, I moved. Did you moved? Yeah, times are tough. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you anyway, uh, Alan. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, uh, with that, uh, can I have a motion to accept this as information? Lauren. Everybody in favor? Okay, thank you. Then that's carried. Now we'll move on to uh, the Agriculture Service Board level of service. Okay, we're ready to go with the level of service document. So. Um, the Ag Service Board has updated our level of service for this year. Our first level of service came about last year. So basically what it was, we took all of our Ag Service Board policies and amalgamated them into a level of service document, which is approved by Council each year on the activities that we will do. Just like, like Alan said, I'm, I've got to report wh what we do. So this document is owned by the Ag Service Board. It must be passed through to County Council, which in our case is the same. I, that that's how it has to has to go about. So, um, this grant this uh, level of service it also uh, mirrors our Ag Service Board grant agreement. Uh, every five years now, I have to fill out a grant agreement that states exactly what I'll do. So, and then every spring, in about a month, I have to report back on what we've accomplished. So that's how we're accountable to getting the funds for our two streams of funding. And we, uh, like we say, we, we get near the highest Ag Service Board grant in the province. That's not necessarily because we're so great at our job. Agriculture is a very big thing in Lethbridge County, and especially with the concentration of intensive livestock operations, that's why we, we, we get the funding for the resource management. It's, it's an environmental sustainable deal. So. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. I hope uh, you've had a chance to, to look at it. And if anybody has any questions, I'll, I'm going to get into a couple in particular that we've changed for this year. I've added uh, the Dutch elm, and we'll go to that policy, and I'm also going to touch on the soil erosion. Bring it up for you here if I can find it. Yeah, it will go to page 83. Yes. All right, I'll go through it, and this is the new one. And uh, Dutch elm disease is on the pest act. Some say it shouldn't be there because it's really not a, an agriculture pest, but nonetheless, they had nowhere else to put it. So we put in our level of, of service document on how we will treat Dutch elm disease. So uh, what we're going to do is we're working with the Society to Prevent Dutch Elm Disease with placements of traps to monitor the movement of the elm bark beetles. So this is done through... Lindsay Bell with the city of Lethbridge. He goes, I believe it's 20 miles from the city. So we're, we're constantly on the lookout for that. So if an elm tree is showing symptoms of the disease, samples will be sent to the provincial lab for analysis, like we're gonna do in Monarch. Well, th there's gonna be some trees tested this year likely. And uh, should test results confirm a positive case of Dutch elm, I will, myself or my designate, will ensure the proper steps are taken uh, for the removal and proper disposal of these trees. In our case, the only landfill that we have is in Iron Springs, and we would remove them, 
to the protocols of the Society to Prevent Dutch Elm and they would be burnt and disposed of that way. That's what they did with the, the ones in the city. They were, they were burnt somewhere, I imagine. Um, Lethbridge County will provide information to residents on the identification and control of Dutch Elm disease by distributing publications provided by the Society to Prevent Dutch Elm Disease. So they're a society, nonprofit that m helps the government uh, carry out the program. So information will be provided to inform residents that Elm pruning ban April 1st to the 30th of each year. You see that on our social media. We're putting that out every year. It's very important not to uh, prune elms during that time because it attracts the beetles, which can can uh, spread the fungus. And of course, elm wood must not be kept or stored as firewood. So that's basically the only thing new that went into the, the level of service. Like I said, it uh, uh, used to be all of our, our policies, but what I want to key in on because it's a hot topic is the Soil Erosion Act. Thanks, Richard. When you talked about firewood, do you mean from disease tree or from any tree? A any elm tree fire. It's illegal to it's illegal illegal to transport any elm wood. It must be there's there's rules on how you dispose of it. I believe it's buried or burned. And uh, what's happening now when these guys come from Saskatchewan? Large uh, egg producers in Alberta have bought up farmland in Saskatchewan. Uh, they have hired men, and firewood is at a premium in Calgary. So what I'm told is that there's been cases where they take all these dead trees. It's good. They think it's good firewood, and they're bringing it into Calgary, which can spread it and, and bring the, the the beetles as well. So that's why it's illegal, and that's why we're promoting, and they're constantly promoting, don't move the, the firewood. Uh, just a little bit more on, on, on Dutch Elm. The, the folks that are going to be doing our survey are very active in Saskatchewan, and they see Dutch Elm every single day, and they really know what they're looking for. If uh, one tree uh, gets infected, that whole stand can be taken out very rapidly. So they're, what's happening is abandoned farm sites where people have moved on or big farmers have taken over, uh, they, somebody sees that wood and they think, well, it's dead. I'm just going to take it for firewood, but, but not a good idea. So we're going to continue to promote that sort of thing. And um, they, We're going to do the Monarch area and we'll likely move this around. But when we put out this promotional material and the city of Lethbridge had Dutch Elm, when they put out promotional material, their phone rang off the hook. Everybody's got Dutch Elm. It's, here, it's everywhere. It's, it's not the case, but we want to be on top of it. Okay, Eric. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <coughs> are residents in the area going to be able to request inspections? I live a mile and a half north of Monarch. I know I got about 50 elm trees. Uh, is there a way that there's going to be residents can request it at that time? So we have to work within the budget. So I got the quote for them to do this work, which it isn't costly. And I've added the farms that surround that quarter that Monarch is on. Um, we can come in ourselves and do it or we can have if we see a bunch like i drove through monarch you know doing a survey of how many elm trees are there there's there's not that many that's why i included the farm rounds around I'll, i i can inc increase the area and and get them if you have 50 elm trees that's what we're looking for that we do want to look at that so w it's possible we can include include your farm in that survey okay john thank you mr chair would you be able to expand a little bit and touch on why it's such a problem to store the wood for firewood or in and have it uh, have it used as that? Yeah. Okay. We were we're taught last year a little bit on uh, Dutch elm, just enough to make me dangerous with information. So we we'll refer to, to to the experts, but the reason being is that when you cut a, a, an elm tree right now it'll start the sap or it will leak, right? So that attracts the elm bark beetle who carry the fungus, uh, basically. So when you're storing the wood, the bark becomes loose and the beetles could be in that wood. It's easier for them to be in there in winter, I guess. And we, when we do put out the promotional material, uh, it touches on, on all the, the experts are, are, are stating the why. Uh, so when we go into Monarch, there's going to be a promotional material put out through our social media that we're coming to town 
and they're going to be asking you if we can take a, s a snip off your tree. Uh, we're not going to enter private property uh, and that sort of thing. So hope that answers your question, but I can get you more information on that that's accurate. If there's no uh, more questions on Dutch Elm, we'll go to the next policy that I'd like to discuss, and it's the soil conservation policy, or level of service it is from the old policy. Um, I'm going to go through this, and, then, and just so we can touch on what we are actually doing out there. And remember, the Ag Service Board helps develop and pass all these policies. If you want to give me direction on changing this, we can change that at, at some point here in the future. So soil conservation, uh, first point, Lethbridge County ASB recognizes the protection of the soil quality and integrity is vital to agriculture and environmental sustainability as mandated by the Soil Conservation Act to prevent loss or deterioration from taking place. Number two, soil conservations will be issued at the discretion of myself under the provisions as outlined under the current Soil Conservation Act. When a notice is issued and compliance is lacking, remedial work will be carried out either by the county or by contractor designated by the county. Remedial work may include work done in field to stop that or cleaning up county roadways and, and ditches of, of soil deposits that have accumulated. So when cleaning the county road ditch, uh, when that's involved, the landowner will be forwarded a notification of impending work to be undertaken along with an estimate of the cost for the project. The cost for the work will be calculated at the Alberta Road Builders and Heavy Construction Association current rate, which is in our schedule fees. And when remedial work is complete, the legal titled landowner responsible will be issued an invoice. If the invoice is left unpaid after the due date, the amount will be subject to all penalties and interest charge. So if they're not paying it every month, it's, it's getting tacked on interest until it hits the property tax roll. And so like they say, all invoices exceeding 120 days will go to the tax roll. And where a notice is issued and in the judgment of myself, uh, service, uh, the prosecution of court of law appears to be the only alternative, the matter will shall be first reviewed to you. So if I think it's going to be a heavy deal where lawsuits involved, we're going to meet with the Ag Service Board first. This is states how we handle things. Notices are always a last resort just like the Weed Control Act. We do not give weed notices just because you got a weed. We tell you hey can you take care of this and you do you're not getting a notice. This has been a very effective way for Lethbridge County to operate for both the Soil Erosion and Weed Control Act over the years. However things are really up in the air now. The soil. So uh, if we want to change how we do things, we, we, you have to give me a little direction. Uh, in the past, I give a soil conservation notice just outside the city of Lethbridge, maybe eight years ago. I was told at the time I was the only soil conservation notice given in the province in 10 years. People are not giving soil erosion notices. They're working with producers or they have other ways of getting things done. So what normally happens, um, if it's a if it's a day where we get a call if it's if it's a one-off farmer that's not farming maybe correctly well we know who they are and we're watching those quarters and if if we're telling them you got to do something and if they don't we'll give them a soil conservation notice in the current day in the times soil erosion is involving farmers that it's, it's good farmers are being affected and there's not a lot that can be done it's wind event uh, I go to look for soil erosion and, and you know, it, it's pointless when everybody's land is blowing. It, we're giving the soil erosion notices to the people that are not complying in year after year. Those are the guys we keep contacting. In the future, if it's dry, where do we go with this? Do I don't think um, it would be good to me to go out 30 notices and, and we're, we're, you know, the farm community doesn't want to see me anymore. Our, our idea is to help farmers and work with them. So uh, we'd like to continue on and, and do things as we are, but it's, it's open for discussion, and that's why I brought this, this one up. Mark? Yeah, I, I agree. I think the, the educational piece is going to be huge and, and really 
that's something we're gonna have to work on because to me moving forward we're gonna have more wind events we're gonna have more of this i talked to a neighbors i'd drive around through the winter whenever we had winds just out of curiosity check on our roads and there's one quarter on 845 that was the one day was just horrific and there wasn't much so i talked to a neighbor and he says well, what can you do the ground's frozen the guy's stuck and then we had that major storm and i was driving around the county and the same thing 10 feet you couldn't see in front of you and it was feet everywhere so um like you say you know who the frequent flyers are those are the ones to you know keep after but the other people just educate help out and like the option you know op our option of uh, manure spreading or something to work on that i think is is going to be more where we should be moving to yeah, and what was effective last year was when we put out, we're, we're hitting social media with all this information. If you take a chance to look, it's, it, there's some good information, but it's dated. That's why we, we produced the articles with Farming Smarter. We wanted some more current information to, to put out to producers. And it's met uh, a lot of, it, it's got a lot of headway. Like, it's out there everywhere, that information. But we'll continue to, to put it out. But the public service announcement we put up out was picked up by... Uh, some of the news outlets so then we got really good coverage and then our phones start ringing and you want to do talk about it and you know it, it got some very good coverage in the 29 years I've worked here there's the odd case of soil erosion and we dealt with it how we had to it was just the odd farmer and the last two years our assistant ag fieldman who helps me with the er erosion when we're, we're out there scouting he has got um, decades of experience in two years he's got more just as much experience as i do now because all of this is happening today and when we seed it's going to it, it has the potential to be brutal and you, you got to carry on no if there's not any more questions that's just the discussion point i, I wanted to have i think like I said, we're very forward in dealing with producers. We make the uncomfortable phone calls for soil erosion and the uncomfortable fo phone calls for weed inspection. Lots of other municipalities are, are not doing that. They're cleaning the ditches. Uh, there's The other component is there's an expense to the county for cleaning ditches. Last year I did a little inventory of how many culverts were affected. I think I give the Public Works Department six quarters with culverts that needed to be cleaned. At first when there's an, a, a wind event the culverts are plugged to the top. If it rains, snows, which it hasn't, that soil settles. It's very fluffy so the problem that looks horrible is never as bad as it looks. But continued events over the next two, three years, who knows what, it's going to start to cover culverts where there's a larger expense to the county. So what I, I have been suggesting to producers, which is coming up, if, if it keeps happening, the expense is going to be borne by whose ever field it was. And lots of guys, they will, they will clean it, but we're not going to have farmers out there cleaning their ditch with their own equipment. That leads to drainage issues. They'll, they'll change the drainage, perhaps. Uh, they'll get too deep. Like the one that we did this year, it just skimmed the top. The, 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 the guy that did the work was exceptional work next thing you know you're digging a little too deep and the weeds are there so now we have another problem so we think we've been effective but i i fear for the future if it continues to be dry and i'm i'm just putting it out there uh there's going to be we'll be talking to your your neighbors and and uh there may be issues where it, it comes to a bigger head you know, it's not a fun job to do to, to tell people to get out there now and do something so in in your uh your experience that you had is it uh, the people that usually it's a lot of times it's the same person uh, is it that these people need more education or these people just don't care no uh, even now with good farmers it's crop rotation a lot of the times uh, all the the crops that we can grow in, in irrigated crops in the county is, is causing the issues and then some of these crops are coming off very late so they're coming off in the end of October there's nothing they can do all of a sudden the snow's here the ground's frozen they can't put manure on it so they're stuck in a spot like this is affecting very good farmers with very good intentions and like I said a lots have adapted by growing winter wheat so they grew winter wheat to hold that but that was silage crops that come off where they could reseed you don't have that option for some things it's, there's, no, there's no winning in some cases. 
And then those good producers, when I asked them if they would be willing to clean the ditch, they are, and they will use a, a private contractor. I, th I hope the practice has changed and it's, it, we start to get some moisture where we don't have to deal with this for another 20 years. Lloyd? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So one of the worst areas I've seen are the <coughs> dryland corners on Timothy. Like, they, they're really bad out in my way. I don't, like, I don't know what you do with that either. That's a very good point. The corners, the irrigated corners, are, are, are they're blowing. So you have these, all, all the corners where the, where the road meets, it's causing the problem because it all the drives on the corners. It, it, it's a problem. And I think folks are adapting. They're going to put grass in there or a different type of grass where they're not uh, harvesting that portion. Or, and some guys are just manuring their corners because that, that'll hold it as well. Back when I started, soil erosion did not happen on irrigated fields as much as it did on dry land. Now the dry land are direct seed. We don't have those problems on the on the dry land as much. They, then it's really helped producer, producers in that regard and made dry land farming, you know, a lot better for soil erosion. But it's all mostly all irrigated fields now. Eric, thank you. Can we also recognize that uh, the threat of uh, water contamination from manure going on frozen ground is a lower threat than our soil erosion threat, and that we can actually look at a, a three week, uh, a couple months in the fall after frozen, which could still apply. Maybe we got to double our, our perimeters to, to waterways or any of that, but that it's not, uh, it's not a critical threat to put on a dry product in the, on frozen ground. Yeah, and that's why the NRCB allows it. You're absolutely correct in stating the soil erosion is worse than the effects of the, or could be worse than the effects of the manure. And they will uh, recommend, I think, on the distances, you got to remain away from ditches and water bodies and things like that. So it, the, the, it's a quick phone call, and usually I, I'm hearing the answers, yes. And let's remember, when times are tough and the crops are brutal, they don't want to talk to me about soil erosion. That I can catch people on a bad day. And it, it's not good. So we're, we're, we're not going to, we don't want to put ourselves in a position as the egg service board and the egg fieldmen to offending farmers. We have to work nicely. So pretty soon the phone won't ring at all, right? And we have uh, other services we provide that we, we have to keep in touch with producers. Okay, Dory. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I completely understand the, the the line, the the tightrope you're trying to walk, uh, Gary. Like, like you said, we need to we need to be a champion of agriculture, both as an egg service board and as a council. We we need to to promote that industry, but we also need to we have to fill that enforcement role at times because it's it's about the greater good and and the value. I think we have to underline when we're doing our um, informational pieces and advocacy on that is just the value of that thin thin band of topsoil that we have we don't have the luxury of having feet of topsoil like they have in in other places we that's that's where our county thrives on that that thin piece of land there so it is important that we protect it and it is important because unfortunately what happens is is that ground moving begets more ground moving uh, if you have a quarter section moving the odds are the one to the east of it if it's on that line it'll start moving and it's like you said it's from a number of factors it's from being open and having no snow cover to the crops that we're taking off later and later to the fact that it's dry we're not able to to make lumps we're not able to bring up those clods in the fall um, I think it's encouraging that people are buying in we are seeing you know some more aggressive measures we're seeing manure um, being put on where manure had never been put on before we're seeing cover crops we're seeing winter wheat rye even barley seeded in the fall just to try and anchor so it is encouraging i appreciate the work that that you and your team are doing to to make sure that this is getting out there um, i've had people comment on it i've had people come to me and i know there was an issue not too far from me and and he was appreciative that your you and your team were, were willing to look, to work with them and the uh, the adjacent producer where the land was moving and and I think like you said all parties went away happy they realized it was an issue they realized it had to be dealt with um, because once again that's how they make their living so thank you for what uh, for what you do uh, I know it's not probably what you signed up for initially I don't 
I don't think this was a prevalent issue, like you said. It's just really come to bear these last few years. So um, I appreciate the direction we're going in. There has to be that, that enforcement element. Um, I know you don't want to go there, but, but I appreciate that we, we do need a hammer, essentially. We do need something because it, it's just too valuable not to have it. Okay, thanks for that, Tori. And uh, John. You had your hand up, and I want you to ask a question now. <laughs> okay, um, so no more questions for Gary. Then I guess we're looking for a motion to move that the Agriculture Service Board uh, level of service. No, I'll put my hand up. Okay, you're going to move that one? Yes. Okay, uh, so John moves that uh, the Agriculture Service Board 2020 level of service to the County Council for approval. Any questions? Everybody in favor? That's carried. That brings us to the end of our uh, of our meeting. And okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we we're going to have more in service training with Alan. He's going to come back as soon as we get our. Alan's going to come back, and we're, we're going to get our food at 10 2, and he's going to continue on through uh, through lunchtime. If it's easiest for the committee, I can easily go grab the stuff Alan can start, and I'll just bring food to everybody. Yeah. Mm. Sounds good. Yeah, so we could adjourn yeah. the meeting uh, with that. Normally, the meetings don't last that long, but the, the it is mandatory that new members take training. So normally, uh, an egg service board meeting might last uh, mm -hmm. two hours at the most. Is that, that's our focus. Not, not not this long so okay well thank you thank you Gary okay Morris now you may do your duty <laughs> okay Morris adjourns the meeting everybody in favor